very special pleasure and honor for me to have been invited to join you at this uh, 12th annual conference. Very few professional gatherings can make the scale of impact on our collective uh, prosperity and national development as the Chartered Institute of Bankers can. Indeed, your professional association would have been number one among professional associations, but for the fact that it is second only to the Nigerian Bar Association. <laughs> I see, that, I see that a few of my friends of the Nigerian Bar Association who have defected into the banking profession <laughs> are finding it difficult to agree one way or the other. But quite seriously, we are at a crucial point in our economic history as a nation. After emerging from a recession, we have attained a reasonable measure of macroeconomic stability, positive growth for almost two years. We've also seen inflation falling sharply from close to 18% to about 11.02 today. But the challenges remain significant. Our population is growing at about 3% per annum. And roughly 1.7 million young men and women are coming every day, every year, into the marketplace. We will have the third largest population in the world in just under three decades from now. We all know what we need to do, no question at all. Every one of us knows what we need to do. We must create good jobs and opportunities. We must rapidly industrialize. We must provide the environment for local businesses, small and large, to create wealth and value. We must also address the concerns of young entrepreneurs and startups and the small traders, the millions at the bottom of the economic value chain, the millions at the bottom of the pyramid, those who sell from their trays and tabletops all over the markets in our country. We must develop the housing sector, both to provide much needed shelter, but also to boost local opportunities in the local building and building material sector. We know that we must ramp up our agricultural production and provide a more efficient uh, farm to market value chain. Again, creating millions of jobs in farming and agribusiness generally. We cannot successfully do any of these things without a massive improvement in our infrastructure, in power, in rail, in roads. But little can be done with, with industrialization without cheap credit to MSMEs in particular. Our retail and service sectors need consumer credit to scale up. If you have to pay cash for everything, from TV sets to cars, consumer spending will remain stunted, and so will the real sector. The major housing reform we are, which we are undertaking with the Family Homes Fund needs a robust mortgage finance market. The bottom of the pyramid traders need microcredit and financial inclusion. With the signing by Mr. President of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, there are great opportunities and challenges. We have great opportunities to extend the reach of our banking and financial services across Africa, where we're already making waves, and export more, where we're already exporting, especially in fast-moving goods, in cement, even fintech now, services account at the moment for up to 50% of the GDP of most African countries and has accordingly been included as part of the phase one of, our, of, of the uh, AFCTA, that's the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreements, in, the, in phase one of the negotiations. Five priority areas have been identified for liberalization, namely transport, communications, tourism, financial services, and business services. The approach that is being taken is that countries will make offers to liberalize these sectors and also agree on regulatory changes that will make it easier for the African sector operators to do business in other African countries. That's an interesting phase because it involves the financial sector. 
how that will be negotiated. Phase two of the negotiations will focus on investment, competition policy, and intellectual property. Although it's a bit early now to know what the negotiations will yield, it is clear that the objective must be to ensure national treatment for African service operators in the different African countries where they all operate. This holds potential for the Nigerian banking sector, which, are, which is already present in several African countries and is poised to take full advantage of the level playing ground that the AFCTA will offer them. But we must improve infrastructure to expand our manufacturing base and produce cheaper. This is crucial because we are also the target market for all of Africa. We are already dealing with the threat of smuggling. Practically all of, of the smuggling that we're seeing come, of course, naturally, from our next door neighbors. But we'll now have to contend with the threat of dumping with, with uh, the AFCTA. This is why the negotiations going on at the moment are crucial. And I think it's important for the banking sector to pay attention to what is going on and to participate in this entire process. We already have fairly robust participation from uh, Manufacturers Association and several other trade and professional organizations. But I think the Chartered Institute of Bankers must pay close attention to, to the negotiations that are going on because a lot of it will affect the banking sector in Africa. But the sum and substance of what I'm saying is that our financial services sector now has to also redefine itself challenge itself to partner with the public sector and players, of course, in the capital markets to reap the immense benefits that await our economy and our people in these changing times. We must jointly think through how to really lend to MSMEs and the entire real sector, how to deepen capital markets on financial mediation, how to partner in developing our mortgage market, what we need to do to deepen consumer credit, car purchase schemes, etc. How about lending to agriculture? The CBN has already, uh, in partnership with some banks, successfully given loans to almost a million farmers under the Anchor Borrowers Program. But the need is far greater. There is a series of measures we have taken to unlock lending to critical labor intensive sectors of the, of the economy. In agriculture in particular, we've seen how the Nigerian incentive-based risk-sharing system for agricultural lending, otherwise known as NERSA, has given the banking industry greater confidence to unlock new capital for uh, agribusiness entrepreneurs, or uh, those who are called agropreneurs today, by de-risking value chains across the nation. The immediate dividend of the enhanced agricultural productivity is, of course, the sharp increase in the population of employed and banked Nigerians while reducing our foreign exchange expenditure on food imports, which can now, of course, be expended on our expensive infrastructural needs and other investment programs for further job creation and enhanced financial inclusion. We're leveraging on the success of the knowledge and experience of our work with NERSA to also fundamentally reform the solid minerals development fund to de-risk value chains in the solid mineral sector. With a risk-sharing mechanism to secure lending from the banking sector for private capital to inflow and build new allied industries. We're also in discussions with PENCOM and some of those discussions we've had with uh, some banks already along with PENCOM to de-risk pension funds to enable lending for, for infrastructure development. There's a lot that's going on. There's a lot of talking that's going on, a lot of engagement that's going on. But we really need to move this forward. We really need to start doing and implementing a lot of what has been happening. Of course, there's a great deal of shyness because this is new territory for everybody. But I think that we really need to move quickly and we need to move efficiently. Financial inclusion, of course, is the key to realizing so much of what we expect as an economy. And the president, a promise in his uh, June 12th speech to lift 100 million people out of poverty in 10 years. That is the commitment of, of the government of Nigeria. We started that journey with our collaboration with the Bank of Industry to deliver the JEEP program, better known as Trader Money and Market Money. 
by providing microcredit to almost 2 million petty traders. The Bank of Industry has now brought this huge bottom of the pyramid into the formal financial system. And that has been recognized worldwide. They, uh, recently, they won uh, the AFDB Prize for uh, financial inclusion because of the work that they did with trader money. This is a huge, this is a huge task. Going forward, we now need to embark on financial training for all of those who have been brought into the net. As you know, when they're given 10,000 10, naira, just 10,000 naira, when they pay back, they're given 20,000 and it goes 15,000 and it goes all the way. But at that point, they're given their BVNs, they're, they're given BVNs, they're formally included in the, financial, in the financial system, they're formally included as formal traders. And so we're able to train, we're able to give them financial training uh, and, and, and all that. Now, the important thing, uh, and I have seen that sometimes we do not recognize the real needs that there are. And for very long, that bottom of the pyramid has been completely excluded. And yet, informal trade is a significant, of course, the most significant part of trading that is going on in our country. But what we found is that these individuals who are given money, who have small inventories, very small inventories, as I was saying the other day, I was in KB State uh, to commission, uh, to launch the trader money scheme there. Yeah. And I was speaking to a, a lady who had vegetables, and selling vegetables, small vegetables, as to how much her entire inventory was. It was everything she had on her trade was 500 naira. All that she was going to sell from morning to evening that day was 500 naira. And it was very evident and that clearly this, this is, you know, I mean, this is someone who obviously wants to work, but there's no way you're going to ever make any significant impact on your own life or the lives of family if your inventory is only 500 naira. And that's the story of petty trading. That's the story of informal trading across the country. Even here in Abuja, uh, I met a lady who was selling uh, for more in a bucket. And I keep telling the story everywhere I go. In her little bucket, she had, you know, for more. I asked her how much. I hope everybody knows what for more is going to <laughs> Because uh, people are looking at me rather strangely. I said, what is that thing that I'm saying? Anyway, for those of us who know what for more is, you know, she was selling this in her uh, little book. And I asked her how much the entire inventory was. 3,500 naira. So I said to her, how, you make, how, how much do you make? How do you make profit from 3,500 naira? She didn't even answer the question. She just pointed to another lady standing beside her who had her own for in a little bowl. You know. So she was just telling me that, look, here, I'm a big player here. Do you have any problems? You can ask this lady here, how she's coping. So there is a, there's a real need out there, and we must devise the methods by which those at the bottom of the pyramid can be uplifted. And we must look at how we can, how we can even resource the entire value chains. What you find is that those who are selling, the petty trader who just has a trade, is usually selling you know, little bits and pieces from many of the manufacturers of fast moving products. And we found that just by giving them credit, we can resource that entire value chain all the way up. And we're working with the, you know, uh, the Bank of Industry with several uh, players in the market, especially the marketing services people, to identify how to work through those value chains so that more and more of these people can move from petty trading higher up you know, on the value chain as they are resourced. But all of that, will depend on what the banking industry is prepared to do, how adaptable the banking industry will be to giving loans, especially microcredit. Everything is changing very quickly. There is no question at all that the world that we're living in is disrupted daily by technology. But Nigeria is in a very fortunate place. We are today the second largest users of mobile, uh, uh, of, of the internet on mobile telephones, on our, on our mobile phones. We are the second largest. We also possibly have the, 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 the largest mobile uh, banking business already. We already have the largest. In other words, 
because we have such a large number of telephone users, and I think it's about 117 million at the last count, there's a huge market out there that appears to be, I mean, the fintech business and all of that, that appears to be somewhat outside the, the formal banking system. I've been speaking to uh, the this, uh, I've been speaking to a lot of the telcos, and I've had meetings with telcos and banks, and you know, and there's a you know fair amount of tension going on because obviously uh, the uh, telcos appear to want to take the launch of the uh, banks, and everyone is saying no, you can't go that far, you can't do this, you must become a licensed bank and all that, and a lot of the fintech companies are doing incredible things across borders, and we're at a point where you cannot stop anything. You can't stop the progress that is going on. There's no way. So we must sit down and develop policies. Policies that will enable the fintech companies to grow. Policies that will find space, proper space for the telcos also to grow. The banking industry is being disrupted and it simply must change. And this is happening everywhere in the world. But I see that uh, the responses of many of the banks is a very progressive one, and the central bank also. We established uh, something called the uh, Creativity and Technology uh, Group as part of the industrial, uh, as part of our industrial council. And what has happened is that a lot of the young men and women, especially in fintech and entertainment, who are part of that group, are showing how we can modify policy especially policy that will help them to be able to not only access credit, but also change some of the rules for banking licenses and other financial services licenses so that the fintech companies can play a better role, so that you know, all of these companies that are involved in, in the financial space can play a more active role. And we think that that is the way, uh, that's, that is the way of the future. So we are living uh, in exciting times. These times are the best times possible for business and for, uh, the, for the Nigerian economy. I am extremely, uh, I'm extremely pleased to see that the theme of this conference seeks to address the changes that we should, ex uh, that we should expect, not just from the banking sector, but from the entire economy. And I want to congratulate again and commend uh, the Chartered Institute of Bankers and the leadership of the Institute for thinking so, for forward thinking and, and, and for thinking uh, so clearly about what the future will be. So in the next few days, I, in the next few days, I really hope that um, we'll see and hear a lot of very interesting and exciting um, deliberations and conclusions that will enable this country to solve the problems that, uh, that, that, that face it and to take up all of the opportunities that, that are waiting. So it is my very special uh, privilege to formally declare open this 12th annual conference of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. Thank you very much.